the changing way of life during the 19th century as we switched from working our own family farm within the neighborhood to being factory workers. Nothing about today's big government, big business, or even our neighborhoods makes any sense until we learn of the social consequences of our switch from working the family farm to being factory workers. The following description of everyday life is the summary of Jack Larkin's book, The Reshaping of Everyday Life, 1790-1840. For many persons who live in the U.S. today, these were the ways of our great-grandparents, great-grandparents, great-grandparents. Throughout the upcoming description, you might like to compare each aspect of life in the past to that of your own today. In their book, First Hand America, the authors quote Mr. Dooley, who said in 1906 that history is all about what people died for, but not what they lived for. What follows here in this description will be a social history rather than political history. Larkin says that everyday life consists of everything that is taken for granted, including politics, the wider economy, and the more powerful, who are never completely ignorable, but are of concern to us only sporadically. What most concerns women, men, children, farmers, laborers, and artisans are the routines of work and the seasons and their home and the moments of marriage and birth, sickness and death, traveling, singing and dancing, and visiting, and having social gatherings. Throughout history, kings and queens and their city-states have created trading posts in foreign lands. For example, Carthage in Africa began as a Phoenician outpost around the year 1000 BC. In the 16th century AD, European kingdoms began to create foreign plantations that would produce large quantities of a locally available crop or product as a way to enrich the home kingdom. For example, large plantations were making molasses and rum in the West Indies, while rice and tobacco were grown in the southern area of the future U.S. In this so-called mercantile system, the Crown would write a charter granting a monopoly to a person or group for the trade of a certain product or for the land of a colonial region. The products of each colony were sold mostly in the home nation and the rest sold throughout Europe and other colonies. Part of the profit went to the crown. At this time in history the wealth of a nation was being measured in terms of the amount of gold that its ruler possessed. Industry was very specialized in the colonies colonists produced few of the items needed in daily life. They had to have most things shipped across oceans and typically paid three times as much as was paid for those items in the home country. To ensure that the colonies did not compete with the homeland, colonies were forbidden to make the same products made in its home nation. One person complained that the King of France hoped to forbid the sun from producing the sunlight that competed with his candle makers. Tunis says that England forbade the export of tools to make cloth from wool. Wood was scarce in England but not in the North American colonies. It takes acres of forest to melt iron ore and obtain pig iron, which is free of most impurities. The colonies were allowed to make pig iron, but could not further refine it into wrought iron, or make any final iron products such as pots or tools. That was to be done only in England. Bargain-seeking colonists illegally traded with other nations and with pirates. 
John Hancock was that signer of the U.S. Declaration of Independence who wrote, he said, in letters large enough for the king to read. Still today we say, sign your John Hancock here. Tuna says that the fact that John Hancock was wanted in England for smuggling didn't hurt his reputation in the colonies. Other people moved to the colonial regions in search of a better personal life. Throughout the years 1700 through 1900, typically 2% of the population were leaving a series of European nations for the American colonies. And still today, about 70 million persons, which is 1% of the world's population, are moving around the globe in the same search for a better personal life. These adventurous people most often move to a neighboring nation in which industrialization is more progressed. Only one in 70 of today's immigrants end up in the United States. In many decades, half the U.S. population growth is due to births within the borders and half is due to immigration. Economic growth is driven by both halves. Migrations are as old as our species. DNA studies show that our species expanded out of Africa into the plains of Asia and then into Europe and America. Europeans are children of Asia who in turn are children of Africa. The variety of national ancestries of people in the U.S. today is evident in any list of names from film credits to mailboxes. In contrast, the credits for a movie made in, for example, Britain, will contain mostly British names. Notice that while the immigrating parents perceive some drastic changes in their ways of everyday life in the New World, their children believe that the only culture that makes sense is that in which they are growing. These children perceive instead that certain aspects of the parents' homeland are strange. The children of transplanted Europeans grow up in a culture that is a bit different from that of their parents' childhood. Notice also that the children of adventurous people are often less adventurous than their parents and choose to remain where they are born. In his book, Everyday Life in Early America, David Hawke says that Europeans chose to go to the colonies for many different reasons, all having to do with their pursuit of a better life. Many sought to own farmland. Others sought religious freedom. But there were countless reasons, including relief from a broken heart. Very few immigrants were peasant farmers. About half were free farmers or workers. Remember that in the 1600s, no one on the planet worked in a factory. In fact, factories did not exist until after the 1760s. Immigrants were not unemployed factory workers. To choose to make the move required some financial resources in addition to a certain sense of adventure just as it still requires today. The other half of the immigrants were urban artisans who could afford the cost of passage and often became farmers in the New World, though they had no previous experience in farming. The sudden farmer wondered what are the use of plows, hoes, and rakes, and when to plant and harvest, what portion of this year's crops must be saved to seed next year's crops, and even whether seeds must be planted with a certain side up. Do you know the answers? Could you suddenly become a farmer in a new environment and grow enough food to make it through the next winter? Even more crucially, what would you eat merely one month after you had arrived? On our ocean voyage to the New World, we could take few possessions. When those possessions wore out, they could not be easily replaced because only a portion of the old society and its industries had yet been taken to the New World. In his book, 
the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Andrew Knott describes how one Spaniard left for the mission lands in New Mexico, dressed and equipped like every other Spaniard. But when he returned just five years later, he was dressed and equipped like every other New Mexican. Forks existed in ancient Rome and in 8th century Iran, but not anywhere else in Europe for several centuries. Their use became more widespread in 15th century Italy, but they were not adopted in Britain until the 18th century, and they arrived even decades later in North America. The earliest forks had only two tines. After some decades, additional tines were preferred. Still today, North American and British people hold their forks with opposite orientations. Already by the year 1800, words were being pronounced differently in England and in North America. In England this is pronounced missionary, while in the U.S. it is said to be missionary. In England we say schedule. In North America we say schedule. In England we say Pentagon. In the U.S. we say Pentagon. Similarly, differences grew between European Spanish and American Spanish. Going backward in time, 16th century English is only 10% incomprehensible, but 12th century English is nearly a foreign language. For example, my friend Hester Amstel explains that the one-syllable word night was pronounced in Old English with two syllables as connect, which explains something about why it is spelled in a funny way. In the year 1630, some 4,600 brave and adventurous persons had moved to the parts of North America that would become the U.S. Within 20 years, the population had grown to be 65,000 persons and clear to 1 million by the year 1750 and 5 million in the year 1800. By the year 1800, there were more Irish and Germans than English persons. Germans moved to eastern Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New Jersey. Dutch were in New York and New Jersey. Gaelic speakers were in West North Carolina and in South Carolina. By 1900, there were German and Scandinavian populations in the Midwestern Plains. Chinese and Japanese in the Pacific West, Eastern, Southern Europeans, including Poland, Czech, Slovakia, and Italy, had moved to the East. Florida, Texas, and the Southwest had been Spanish territory and then belonged to Mexico until it became part of the U.S. during the war between the U.S. and Mexico in the years 1845 to 48. In his book, The Spanish Frontier in North America, Weber explains that the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 added Spanish and French territories and languages to the U.S. mix. Weber explains that Napoleon had just acquired from Spain the state-sized region extending from Louisiana to St. Louis, which he in turn sold to the U.S and that the U.S. instead interpreted this transaction to involve the nation-sized region from Louisiana clear to Montana. Napoleon had been thinking of growing a colonial empire in Louisiana, but lost interest after losing a large part of a 30,000-man army while trying to put down the slave uprising on Hispanola, which became the Republic of Haiti. Without this uprising, there might have been French-speaking regions in both Quebec and Louisiana. Before the European arrival, native tribes typically obtained half their food by farming and the rest by gathering and hunting.
Newly settling Europeans were either single-family farmers or operated commercial-sized farms. Initially, the U.S. existed only along the Atlantic coast, but they were differing economic systems within this geographical strip. The Northeast, or New England area, consisted mainly of small family farms that consumed most of what they produced. The rest was bartered at the local general store. There were no plantations or tenant farms in New England. One important factor in hampering the development of large-scale farms in New England was the lack of navigable east-west rivers that would have connected the inland areas to the sea. The South had large plantations that produced a single cash crop, such as tobacco and then cotton, but it grew very little food of its own. The Middle States contained commercially sized grain-producing farms that provided food for the southern plantations. The Mid-Atlantic region, which includes New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, was already producing 15% of the world's iron by the year 1800. These same large commercial-sized farm occurred also in Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee as the nation expanded westward. Whenever farmland could be profitably used this way, there would be both increasing land prices and land speculation. The commercial farms of the middle states were worked by the family members, often with the help of one or more indentured servants, until the practice was outlawed in the year 1776. During the years 1600 through 1776, half of all arriving immigrants came as indentured servants and worked mainly on the commercially sized farms of the Mid-Atlantic area rather than on the single-family farms of the Northeast or on the large-scale slave labor farms of the South. Indentured servants came from all walks of life, but most were young. Three out of four were male, and one in four was female. This person signed a contract agreeing to work for typically seven years for a person who would pay the boat fare for his or her travel from Europe to the Americas. The numbers of Europeans moving to the Americas as indentured servants rose and fell in reaction to the ups and downs of the European economy and with the occurrence of war. In the colonies, indentured servants sometimes ran away for one reason or another. Newspapers contain ads offering rewards for their return. Through the decades, indentured persons were replaced with enslaved persons. During the years 1600 through 1800, 10 million of us humans from Africa were enslaved and taken to North and South America. About 20% of us died on the boat journey because we were given subsistence rations and were packed so tightly into ship compartments that we could barely move. No sanitary facilities were available in these compartments. We died of the flu, dysentery, smallpox, and from severe mental depression. Some of us human beings treated some other of us human beings in this manner because we did not consider the imagined different people to be fellow human beings. The climate and flora of the southern U.S. resembled that of West Africa. We slaves introduced rice cultivation to South Carolina and our experience in animal husbandry was used in managing livestock. We adapted our use of grass and reed to make baskets and mats and used palmetto leaves for fans and brooms and chairs. We also knew of swamps, fishing, 
and the use of alligators, which Europeans had never seen, to protect livestock. We continued to make our own earthenware pots and bowls. We also brought our knowledge of herbal medicines. Some of these things were described above in the description of those of us humans who are Yoruba. At the time that Europeans were enslaving Africans, the continent had many towns and cities, many cultures, crafts, and metalwork. Here is a cast iron mask. This cast brass kudo was made in Asante, Ghana during the 1600s. Individuals from many different African cultures were mixed together as they were enslaved. A few enslaved Africans may have been Muslim. Also notice that as we move from our home culture to the New World, the culture of our children born in our new home was already different from that of our own childhood. Our children's culture was a combination of African and enslaved American. With each generation, our children's culture was increasingly different. A newly arrived enslaved person knew what it was to have been previously unenslaved. Our children, who were born enslaved, could only imagine from the tales of elders what life was like when a person was not enslaved. Those of us who resisted would soon be killed by our enslavers. Charles Lynch was among the first person to hang slaves in what then became known as a lynching. Whenever one of us was killed as a penalty for disobedience, all other slaves within miles were gathered and made to watch. For example, one slave was threatened with 500 lashes if he didn't stop preaching the gospel to other slaves, so he ran off. When he was later caught in Greenville, South Carolina, he was burned alive as all other slaves from within 20 miles were forced to watch. At this house in Charleston, South Carolina in 1822, Denmark Vesey met to begin a slave uprising. Thirty-five of us slaves were hung in mass and left to dangle for some hours to strike fear into all similarly minded slaves. Nat Turner led a slave insurrection in Virginia in 1831. There are many other examples. Some of us enslaved people are making molasses on this sugar plantation in the West Indies. The owners of the island plantations had no wood and did not grow enough food to feed themselves. They exchanged molasses and rum for the wood cows, fruit, butter, cheese, and other transportable food of the New Englanders. It was about a one week long boat trip between these two regions. Products were also taken to Africa to be traded for slaves, who in turn were taken to the West Indies and forced to make the molasses in this circle or triangle of trade. As the Declaration of Independence brought the United States into existence, one in six of us Americans were slaves. From then until after the Civil War, most U.S. presidents were slave owners. Neighboring plantations traditionally took turns providing feasts and celebrations for the others of the area, and this is how many of us slaves met our spouse. It is surprising to people today that those of us who were slaves often married a person who lived on a nearby plantation. We slaves could travel on Sundays to visit them, but only if we had a properly signed card and stayed on the main road. Otherwise, we would be considered a runaway. It may not be surprising that there was no limit to the efforts that us men would expend in getting over to our girlfriend's plantation. For those of us Americans who were slaves, the extended family was crucial in child rearing since we parents were still forced to work even while caring for our infants. It also occurred that after marrying a person enslaved on the same plantation and then having children, either of the parents or any of the children might be sold and moved to another plantation. When we were released from enslavement, 
after the Civil War of 1861 to 65, we had already been Americans for many generations. But it took still another hundred years until the civil rights events of the 1960s to make the previously proclaimed U.S. ideals begin to mean for all Americans. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal.